I didn't see you there. Hey, my name's Joe Jelinski, and I'm a graduate student here at the University of Iowa, and, well, <laughs> I was just looking at a picture of my favorite snail, Potamopergus antipodarum. Hey, you would want to have a little tour around the lab, see how things tick, would you? You would? Great, let's go. Welcome to the snail room. The snail room is where we keep our snails that we get from New Zealand. So each one of these tanks houses anywhere from a single snail to dozens of snails. Let's take a look at one of these. All right, see in there all those little black dots? Each one of those are snails. There's a lot of different types of uh, experiments that are going on at any one time in this room. Uh, one that I'm working with, or I'm overseeing, is a choice test. So what we have here is a computer with a camera and then a tea maze. So we put in a female snail here and we put in a choice between two different types of males and we just look for whether or not the female has a preference for a certain type of male. Pretty cool, huh? So these snails come from all over New Zealand. There's all sorts of different lakes that they live in. And so every once in a while, someone from the lab will go and collect them. Let's take a look at one of the snails right now. So these snails are, can get up to four or five millimeters in length. So they're um, actually sort of referred to as a, as a micro mollusk. So they're really tiny, but under a scope, you can see them uh, really well. And you can see their tentacles, uh, displayed as it's scooting around, eating up food. And so what makes these snails so interesting to myself and other scientists? Well, these snails have both sexual and asexual reproduction, meaning that some lineages reproduce with a mom and a dad to create offspring, while others are all female and essentially clone themselves. So what I do is something called bioinformatics, which means I do a lot of stuff on the computer. And I compare genes from sexual and asexual lineages to see how things might be evolving differently between these types of lineages. So one thing I'm particularly interested in is how the genes and genomes of sexual and asexuals evolve. So how I do that is I compare and align the nucleotide sequences of different genes to get an idea of the rates of evolution that may be different between these two things and what are some uh, diagnostic differences between sexuals and asexuals. And then I also use this information to construct relationships between them. How are these different organisms uh, related to one another? Well, I hope you enjoyed the brief uh, lab tour that I've given you, and um, I hope you have a great day. Bye. I am currently in the beautiful University of Iowa Biology building, and I'm gonna be going through a live practice of one of the NCSC's activities. The activity I'm going to be practicing today is EcoStacks. So this is an activity that connects ecology and climate change. And it's kind of like a, um, a fun or a more informative version of Jenga, in a way. So what we're going to do, and I'm actually going to be demoing this tonight or later tonight, is seeing how different increases or decreases in members of the food web can create imbalances in an ecosystem. So we have these different color blocks and these represents different positions or trophic levels or, or uh, points on the web of the food chain. So we have primary producers, so things like plants, uh, secondary consumer or primary consumers. So this would be something like deer or insects, uh, secondary consumers, and these would be things that would eat the primary consumers. Um, so this could be something like uh, if, this, if this could be a deer, while well, these could be insects, and this could be the insects the grass eats. And then these would be top level predators. So this would be maybe something that would, for example, eat deer, like wolves or something like that. And the energy flow, you know, starting from the sun to the grass to all these producers sort of goes in this, this unidirectional way. But really in ecology, it's a lot more complicated than that. That's why it's called a food web. So I'm gonna practice this activity and see how different variables and different um, actions might uh, change or disrupt the, the ecosystem. So how we do that is we set up this, the playing field and so I have a stack of a lot of primary producers, um, a, a middle or a, a sort of a medium amount of, of uh, primary and secondary consumers and then a top predator. And generally this actually sort of reflects the relative densities 
of these types of um, organisms in, in the world. So there's a, there's a, there's a vast amount of, of primary producers, um, but in comparison, a paucity of um, things like apex predators. So you don't see millions of wolves. So what we're going to do is go through the cards and see how it plays out. And hopefully it uh, plays out well, especially for later tonight. So my card says species shifting upslope benefit from the increased area. Add one primary producer to your ecosystem. All right, easy enough. There we go. So far, so good. Foxes. Oh, and I should, and I should, one thing I didn't mention is there's a north and south component. Something that I forgot the first time I tried it. So basically where are you going to be positioning your blocks? All right, so foxes move northward. So foxes would be a tertiary consumer, so a, a higher level. Add one tertiary consumer to your ecosystem. Okay, so this is a little bit tricky. Don't have a huge amount of space to put it on, but things are still stable though. The ecosystem's still intact, great. All right, moving on. Butterfly influx. Butterflies start appearing earlier, but often cannot food, find food. Add two secondary consumers to your ecosystem. Okay, I think, I think this ecosystem can handle that. All right, might have to do a little bit of nudging. Okay, we're good. Ecosystems, great. Ooh, man, close, but I did it. All right, that one was fine. It's looking pretty, looking pretty dire over there. Climate change alters plant elevation and distributions, causing longer growing seasons, earlier flowering, and earlier harvest. Remove two primary producers. All right, I think this is the this is the game changer right here. Okay, let's see. Uh, maybe this. Oh, okay. So our food web, our, our trophic levels have collapsed, and so. What I find particularly interesting about this activity is it gets across a fairly complicated idea of how um, different tro trophic levels interact with one another. You might not think off the top of your head that, oh, plants affect wolves or something like that, but um, you know, uh, human disturbance or climate change affecting primary producers can have rippling effects to higher levels, so things like wolves. So they're actually... Um, very, they're not directly related, but there's an indirect relation between those two systems. So I think that practice went pretty good. I'm excited to try this out tonight in, um, in Bettendorf in Iowa, and um, I hope you enjoyed it. All right, so uh, as I uh, talked about in my previous video where I was practicing the, uh, the, the EcoStax activity uh, a couple nights ago, I, uh, I did the event in, in Bettendorf, and I think overall it was a positive event. I interacted with over 70 different people and ended up the the attendance there was around 1300 uh, people. So I think overall it went really well. This was the first time that I did it in in this kind of setting. I had just practiced it with myself and my and my wife. So this would be sort of like the first time actually going out in the field and doing it. So I have a couple pros and then one or two cons or things that, 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 that I think I, uh, can, can be worked on. So what I thought was interesting was that a lot of the kids, if they're over like 12 or 13, already knew, had some uh, general idea of what a food web, or I think it's called food chain. When I mentioned food chain, that seemed to click. So I guess that's, that's the, 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 the wordage or whatever that they're using. And so this, you know, gave me an opportunity to ask them and press them for more questions and sort of have them teach me about it. I was like, oh, what, what do you know about a, a food chain and have them explain it to me? And, and for the most part, they did a, did a really good job. And then after that, I was able to introduce it in, in the activity. So that was nice having, you know, some of the visitors have um, sort of a basic knowledge of these, these kinds of, of concepts. And then the general answer was, well, this eats that and that eats that and then this eats that and this eats that. So that, that's exactly what, what we're talking about. Um, so yeah, I think as the night went on, how I interpreted or how I uh, displayed the activity definitely changed. Um, it started out as pretty 
um, not dry, but it, it wasn't as interactive. And then I, as I started learning the activity a lot more, I began to, well, one of the techniques that I, I ended up settling into was having them kind of explaining the concept of the different trophic levels and then have them come up with examples. Like, okay, well, what's something that would be a primary producer and then what would eat this primary producer? And it's like, oh, a, a, you know, an insect. And then have them come up with what a, the uh, secondary, you know, primary consumers and, se and secondary consumers, et cetera. So I think that is something that I'm going to stick with because it, it seemed really successful. It got them sort of thinking about these as not just a Jenga game, that these blocks actually represent somebody, uh, represent something. And I think that was the thing that I was missing from the first few interactions was like really conveying that, you know, this is a, um, these blocks are a proxy for, for things that happen in the natural world. Um, let's see. And then there was, so when I, I'm about to get to my con, uh, but it was nice to see. I think, I think most of the people had a good time. There was about 10, uh, yeah, maybe like around 10 uh, kids that really liked it and ended up doing it three times throughout the night. So um, they brought their friends over and then they had to do it again. They're really into the cards. They, uh, so it, that, it was nice to see someone get like extremely excited about it. Um, and so that leads me to the con, and this isn't a con so much to the game, but just how the setup was is that we were at a STEM fest. I don't know if I mentioned that, but the booth right next to me had a eight foot robot that was playing soccer. So that was certainly competition. It certainly made my block stacking activity uh, maybe not quite sort of pale in comparison to the exciting uh, robot, which by the way was not inquiry based at all. It was just a, just a robot playing soccer. Um, so I, I have that to, to reassure me. Um, but yeah, so that was, that was a tough thing, just having that placement with something that like if someone comes to the booth and start playing the blocks and then they see the, the robot playing soccer, then it was a little hard to kind of keep their attention because, well, there's a robot playing soccer over there. Um, and then also the other side is that young, like really young kids, they really like to see the blocks because it probably um, mimics a lot of the toys that they play with. And so I had several, you know, four year, three or four year olds or even younger. I, I, have trouble judging children's ages but just come up and wanting to play with the blocks and I'm not gonna say shoo don't play with my blocks if you don't want to learn the activity um, so I just you know I played blocks with them for a while and eventually they moved on um, but yes yeah, so I think overall it was it was a successful thing I think by the end of the night I really uh, fell into my groove in terms of uh, the the way I, I did my interpretation and um, yeah it was a, it was an exciting event I'm looking forward to do it, doing it again. Hello, so I just picked up my materials for my climate change in your community project and I'm gonna check them out and then kind of run through a quick uh, demonstration of the activity and, and the concepts. So let's see how things turn out. Hopefully you picked up the right order. Looks about right. All right, so here's the poster that's associated with it, climate change in Iowa. So I'm using tree ring data, so actual tree ring data uh, from uh, out in Ames, Iowa to uh, supplement this project. All right, so far so good. These look good too. So I have uh, this, which I'll explain a little bit later. And it looks like all my cutouts are in good shape. So, time to get cutting. So for this activity, the visitors are going to be doing a few different things. So I have this poster, and what they're gonna be doing is developing a timeline using tree rings, uh, date the samples, and identify climate, climate variables. So what they're gonna be doing is taking these, these core samples that I have uh, estimated here using real, real life data, and then match them to this and try to basically 
line up and align different core samples. And these samples come from differing sources. So we have some young wood, some, a newly cut down tree, a newer house, and an older house and an older shed. So the idea is that we can date when these things happen. So when the wood was taken from these different things, if we have a calibration point, which in this case is the calibration point we know because we know that this tree was recently cored. And so what visitors will do is they will first have to figure out how these all fit together. So part of the clue is coming as the source of the wood, but you can also do it without that, without that information. So in this case, let's see, that doesn't seem right. Hopefully I can do my own activity. Okay, that seems all right. And then let's see here. Yep, that looks good. And let's see, oh, maybe not actually. Let's see, this is gonna be tough. Oh, I see, I see. I was being tricky when I made this. And then this would have to go up here. Okay. So depending on where I decide to choose which one of these is the young wood would be the starting point. So if this would be the starting point, this would be sort of year zero. And then you would count back. And so I've counted 74 rings. So give or take 74 years since the oldest piece of wood was uh, was was removed <clears throat> or, or was generated. So the second thing they're going to be doing is using these stickers here, our, our placards, to identify different variables or find different areas of, of uh, variability. So, for example, fire. So if you have these darkened rings, that would be a situation where fire occurred on that tree. Uh, flooding would be areas where you have these really wide rings. So there's a lot of excess, there's a lot of nutrition, a lot of, a, a lot of available water, a lot of rapid and, and, and growth. And areas of drought would be these really um, close together, close together uh, uh, rings, so something like that. So that you can see that there's been periods of, of flood and drought. And we can see that these tree rings can give in this idea of, of the cl climatic history of, of the region that these samples were taken at. Another added point is uh, this thing that I made. So this is actually, a, there's a semi uh, sort of famous tree in the middle of campus here at U of Iowa and it actually got struck by lightning about a month and a half ago and it got and it needed to be completely removed. So I was able to get a high-res picture of the tree stump before I left. So when visitors come, especially if I'm doing this in Iowa or especially in Iowa City, we can talk about this tree because it's a pretty well recognized tree. It was one of the biggest trees on campus and now it's gone. And then we can talk about sort of a real life example about how we can analyze these different tree rings and the different things that they, that they mean for this particular tree um, in Iowa. So I'm going to test out this activity. Uh, I actually have two opportunities to test out this activity this month, and I'm looking forward to, to seeing how it goes. Bye.